So good, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to our webinar about leveraging artificial intelligence to improve customer experience. The webinar is going to last about 30 minutes, and then we'll have about 10 to 15 minutes for questions. Uh, you can ask questions in a question pane, which by default should be to the right of the screen where you can see the slides that we're talking about. We will send the slides afterwards to everybody who has attended or has registered. So you, the speakers today are three people from different corners of the world. Uh, this is Maurice Fitzgerald speaking. I'm your kind of master of ceremonies today. I retired, a, I'll be two years ago tomorrow as VP of customer experience at, uh, at Hewlett Packard Enterprise, HP. I've, since then I've written four books on customer experience and I'm based in Geneva, Switzerland. Nick, over to you. Thank you, so this is Nick Stroud coming to you from Milwaukee, Wisconsin in the United States. Uh, I currently lead customer experience and net promoter system efforts at Manpower Group. Uh, so we are a global workforce solutions and temporary staffing company um, placing to work uh, well over a few million people across the globe every year. Aliona. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the webinar from me as well. So I'm dialing in from Auckland in New Zealand. And um, my background is in computer science and specifically in the two sub areas of AI, machine learning and natural language processing. Thing. I'm the CEO of Thematic and I frequently speak on these topics uh, and how businesses can use AI effectively. Okay, so the agenda today is uh, pretty pretty simple and straightforward given the time that we've got. Uh, Aliona is going to talk about artificial intelligence and its current state. The main new concept that we want to uh, hopefully be successful in communicating is a concept of prescriptive analytics that lead to insights from unstructured data that you can directly action. Um, there'll be time for questions and I'll summarize the key takeaways at the end of the half hour. So over to Aliona for the discussion about uh, artificial intelligence. Yeah, so to describe AI in really simple terms, it's about building computer applications that perform tasks that are usually associated with cognitive abilities that we as people have. And the history of AI started back in the 50s when um, researchers have tried to build autonomous agents, for example, those who could play chess automatically. And indeed, as you may remember, um, computer beat uh, a, a grand chess master, Garry Kasparov, and this year it actually beat the Go champion, a much more complex game than, than chess. And in turn, machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence. And we all um, have experienced machine learning in action. Whenever we open our mailbox, there will be emails that your email client automatically sorts into a spam folder. Deep learning is in turn a subset of machine learning and um, really useful techniques for analyzing complex data, such as images or, or natural language. And in fact, natural language can be, um, is, is kind of underpinning the, uh, all of these three areas because it's using techniques from all three of them. And um, it's about understanding text or voice data and um, drawing conclusions from it. We all use NLP in our everyday life whenever we use Google search, for example, or whenever we speak to our virtual assistants like Siri or Alexa. There are many examples of AI algorithms out there that you may recognize, but today we will be talking about the few specific ones that actually matter for customer experience. So image analysis, that's kind of uh, interesting. How can image analysis be relevant to customer experience? 
Yeah, sure. So I came across this really interesting um, app where people who want to buy a car can take a photo of the number plate and image analysis is used to recognize what is written on their number plate and then this information is passed on to the app and the app returns back information about the car. So what is happening for customer experience is that an AI algorithm is enabling um, ease of use and this magic moment of all I need to do is just take a photo. And recognizing simple objects like number plates is already a solved problem in AI. But another application of AI is actually recognizing people's faces. Yeah, I'm, I'm at, uh, when I was at HP, one of the things that we had in our innovation center in Geneva was something that would automatically recognize people whose emotions or attempt to do so and other characteristics as they walked into the room, identify how they were feeling depending on their facial expressions, guess their ages uh, and so on. I never got gender wrong in my experience and I think it the software just was complimentary about people's ages and deliberately underestimated. It was certainly consistently about 10 years younger than I, than, than I am. But I guess from a customer experience perspective, if you think about things going on in retail, uh, you'd want to be able to react immediately to emotions. I mean, we are all used to interpreting body language and emotions. We're, for those of you who are in a couple, um, are usually able to recognize the the mood or what's going on with the other person in the couple. Um, you know, I can recognize if my wife is unhappy because I've forgotten to do something I said I would do even without her saying anything. Um, of course, you know, the, I guess the hard thing to deal with is indifference. And if people aren't talking to each other and no emotion is being expressed, that's not a good thing either, is it? Yeah, and you even if you know like what it, whether the person is happy or unhappy, you still need to uh, find out why. But at least um, the facial recognition takes you some some of the way. Um, another use case of AI that I wanted to showcase today is chatbots. And at the Medic, we have work have been working with Air New Zealand, and they have this chatbot called Oscar. And what they found is that not only Oscar is a very easy way for people to ask in their natural language um, for an answer, and it scales really well because it can answer questions from millions of people at the same time, but, um, but also the customer experience and the user experience, experience teams um, learned what are the common issues that um, customers of Ear New Zealand's typically have uh, with a particular um, part of the website or, um, or overall, what are the things that aren't, they aren't doing well? So for example, um, everybody's asking, where can I find my booking reference number? And as an action point from that, um, something that they do is make it really really big in the email once you've um, once you receive the email confirmation after booking a flight and they also noticed that um, they can very early predict if there are any problems so um, when customers suddenly talked about the scam over christmas uh, just now in december um, air new zealand is offering me a free flight is this you and they could immediately issue a statement on, on their Facebook or on their social media that it's not them and people shouldn't be clicking on the link. And uh, Nick, I have heard from you before that you also use chatbots at Manpower Group. Is this right? Yeah, definitely. So we developed a, a chatbot here to help automate uh, some of our recruiting process. You know, in, in North America, we we probably come in contact with well over a million people um, annually. And so what we, what we found as we went through it is that the real value of the, of the bot um, came from, you know, this, this AI uh, continuously mining the conversations and, and really helping us to understand um, how people talk, 
the words and languages that they use, when they interact with us, um, how many times they're willing to interact before uh, a, a conversation tends to go dormant. Um, you know, all of those things helped us to, to learn how to engage with them better and ultimately just to, to deliver more value and, and to get them what they wanted to uh, what they wanted to accomplish much faster. So a lot of, a lot of, we've certainly found a lot of value in leveraging um, bots and AI in our business. Yeah, I, I got the airline scam thing over over Christmas too. You reminded me over uh, when, <laughs> of that uh, when when you mentioned that came up in the Air New Zealand chatbots and so on. But what about predictive analytics? How would predictive analytics be used for customer experience? Um, yeah, I would like to quickly explain the idea behind um, behind the predictive and prescriptive analytics. Um, we're using this example. So imagine you own a cafe. Who is a better customer? A freelancer who works each day, two hours, and buys coffee? or a company owner who brings their team once a month uh, for a group lunch or, and buys dessert for everybody? Should you advertise as a cafe to freelancers or to company owners? So if you have a simple business, um, a more complex business than a cafe, you can imagine that simple math like this won't help. And you have all of this data about um, you, that you have collected in the past about your customers and um, Predictive analytics is about using this data to help you make decisions. Yep, uh, and I think probably the key decision for many co companies, the key insight that they'd like to have about many of their customers is uh, what's the customer lifetime value? How much money, how much profit is a customer going to bring in over their entire lifetime of doing business with you? And um, direct marketers traditionally think of this in terms of re of RFM, recency, how recently did they buy something, ha frequency, so how often do they buy, and monetary value. So how often do, do people buy, how recent was it, and how much do they spend? The challenge, of course, is that's observing the past. Um, that works well for customers that have been with you for quite a while. But what about the new customers? Oh, what we're hoping and expecting that artificial intelligence brings to, to the game is to better predict and more quickly predict which of the new customers are going to be the amazingly great, valuable customers. Um, you know, that that example and the terminology I use sounds like consumer examples. When you think of many business to business cases and things like SaaS software, the key thing you want to predict and the most important factor in customer lifetime value is whether the customers are going to renew their contract or not. You know, we call that churn, whether people are going to unsubscribe, whether people are going to convert from having perhaps a free period of service to uh, taking on an annual contract. Um, you know, it's easy to observe the history, uh, but AI gives us insights about the future. So, but you know, I'm not an expert in it. How does that actually work, Eliana? Um, yeah, it's all about similarity between customers and detecting the, the uh, patterns. So how it works, well, step one is you need to collect data about past behavior. Um, and it's not just the attributes of the customer, but also what actually happened to them uh, with them in the past, um, who are um, as many attributes um, customer segment, demographics, um, who they worked with, and so on. And then the step two is to ask the question about what you'd like to predict. But then step three is to use a machine learning algorithm to make a prediction given the data observed in the past. And ideally, the more data, the better. But um, what is starting happening, the deep learning algorithms and the, and the more advanced uh, machine learning algorithms also can be quite good even with small amounts of data. Sometimes algorithms are so good to, in detecting patterns that um, they're a little bit ahead of us. And I know that Nick wanted to share an interesting story here. 
Yeah, certainly. So, uh, you know, I think we've talked about it in the one of the most, um, I don't want to say common, but interesting stories that's out there. I think it was in, in 2012 when this happened, but uh, Target developed a predictive model that they, they actually called the pregnancy prediction score. And I think it looked at um, about 25 different unique products that women had purchased, things like vitamins or um, unscented lotions. And it used the combinations of um, people buying these things and when they bought them to not only predict that they were pregnant, but to actually predict the due date um, to a pretty good degree of accuracy. And which if you're a, if you're a marketer or a company, you're thinking probably this is great, right? I can, I can understand basically uh, when people, to Maurice's point, move from one customer segment to another uh, without them even giving me any indicators. But, you know, the, the long story short of this, and maybe where some of you might even be thinking is um, what ended up happening is Target packaged all these up into a series of coupons and offers and sent them to uh, an 18 year old girl who actually was still in high school and lived at home. And her father intercepted this uh, targeted offer and ended up going to a Target store and confronting a Target manager about it who had no idea. And turns out he had a long conversation with his daughter and Target was right and ended up going back to Target and apologizing. Uh, and it, I, the, the thing that struck me was both sides of it, that on one side, the tremendous power that AI and uh, predictive and prescriptive analytics can have to transform and really grow revenue. And on the other side, just the tremendous sort of responsibility that you have to leverage uh, and harness your customer data um, correctly. Yeah, Nick, I think you also had another really interesting example uh, to do with a telco. I don't remember what one. Yeah, so there, yeah, there is a telecommunications company. Aliona and I were, were speaking about this previously that um, one of the things that they found was when they had a customer that had, you know, used the word churn. So when they had a customer that had um, canceled their contract, uh, the, the friends and family of that customer were also at a significantly elevated risk of canceling their contract um, soon as well, which was a really great insight for this telecommunications company to have because, you know, this predictive model then, then immediately could help them flag situations where they could intervene quickly um, and identify basically these at-risk customers and, and insert a series of offers or, or deliver higher levels of service to them to basically get in front of this, this potential churn down the line. So just another great example of predictive uh, models through AI to, to prevent future churn. Yeah, and I think social media also plays a big role. I remember about five years ago, I was talking to people at Procter & Gamble around uh, about a project to start scraping social media data and to try and identify problems with hair care products before they became major issues. And that's how quickly would somebody, let's say in New Zealand, say that uh, tell their friend that they used this new shampoo and their hair fell out? And how quickly could they react to it? But in the social media circles, it, it could become really dramatic. Like if somebody who's running a YouTube channel on hair care suddenly picks that up, then you, know, you could be you could be doomed, whether it was actually true or not. Right. So that's uh, people with large social media followings will be will have disproportionate influence. And you need to know who is who. The people aren't all the same. But let's go on to the thing that is really, to me, new and where I've been trying to learn as much as possible, which is called prescriptive anal analytics. You're the one that introduced me to the term, Aljona. What is it? Yeah, um, um, <laughs> I didn't know that um, that I introduced you to this term. Interesting. So um, the predictive analytics is about, as we just discussed, it's about predicting what's ha what based on what happened in the past, what will happen in the future. And prescriptive analytics is about what can you actually do to um, prevent something from happening. So it's about automatically detecting risks and opportunities and then triggering an action that will help, uh, help in a detected situation. 
And how it works is that we basically collect data about actions taken, and then we observe the outcomes, and then we, we um, again, like in the, in the predictive analytics, recommend what would be the most likely action to, um, to perform. So the easiest is to just use this example of churning that uh, you've been mentioning throughout the webinar. Uh, descriptive analytics will tell us how many customers have churned and predictive analytics, how many customers will churn in the next month or in the next year, whereas prescriptive analytics is about which actions will retain this, uh, these predicted churners. You can predict um, different things um, such as uh, and anticipate um, the action. Nick, you have a story here about um, what's been happening with Amazon's anticipator, anticipator shipment. Yeah, I love this. I love this example. And so Amazon, right, is uh, all over the news, just in the news today about creating a new healthcare company. And um, so here's an example of where they're, they have a, a patent for, uh, I think it's the anticipatory shipment patent, basically just by looking at your um, activity in Amazon, the duration you spend on the website, the things you click, um, the things you put in your wish list, even the things you just hover over. Uh, what Amazon can do is basically feed you up a series of offers that they feel uh, so strongly that you're probably going to buy it that they can they will already start the shipping process to your general location. So it really becomes the situation where. Uh, you know, you place an order and it's delivered to you within the hour. Uh, not because you intended to get it that fast, just because Amazon has already started the process and knows that you're you're going to buy it. So, so this idea of, you know, delighting customers through that realm, leveraging AI, uh, really, really interesting. Oh, that's a great pattern, pretty unique customer experience, and bordering on the creepy, I would have to say. But hey. <laughs> um, another interesting example is from Didi Chuxie. Uh, has anybody heard of this company? It's uh, the China's ver version of Uber, and because it's China, it's um, much more, much larger than Uber actually. So they have four hundred and fifty. Two million users, and you can imagine how um, much data they collect for every ride that's happening uh, through their app. And they have a really cool example of prescriptive analytics uh, that relates to the customer feedback collected um, after the rides, and specifically the Net Promoter Score surveys. So what they found is that the data they've collected throughout the rides actually correlated um, to the NPS score that um, they collected through customer feedback. So what this means is that they were able to build a model that, given the data, can predict the um, satisfaction score, whether somebody is a promoter or detractor, for example. So then they used a prescriptive model that would suggest an action that would increase the chance of promotion. For example, if the trip isn't going well, if um, the ride is a bit late, the company issues an apology, um, and the driver also would receive this information in real time, and then um, if the, they, they would know if the customer is likely to be a promoter, and only in those cases they would say, hey, can you please uh, recommend us to your friends and family? Yeah, I, I really like that. You know, one of the challenges that there is generally in customer experience is we're pretty quickly to act on the things that go wrong, but we often struggle to work out how to activate the people who are enthusiastic, the promoters in the net promoter system. Um, now, but talking about actionable insights, you know, I've seen all sorts of analysis of customer feedback, meaning the the written feedback that they give, or even voice to text uh, uh, feedback, like what you mentioned for DD there. Um, most of what I've seen is full of single words, like in their case, it would be car or driver. You know, that seems really hard to make into something actionable. What does artificial intelligence bring to the table? 
Um, yes, yeah, so deep learning um, are the artificial intelligence methods that have been developed over the past um, five, three to five years. And um, what they enabled is actually much more deeper and accurate analysis of natural language, the way it comes through customer feedback in surveys and, and other, um, other sources. And um, this is something that we use at Thematic. We use deep learning algorithms to detect themes that are actionable. So um, for example, one of the themes that we discovered really early on in the customer feedback is that a user interface that a company or one of our customers has released was hard to read. So as an action, they immediately knew that they need to change the font uh, on their user interface. and and fix fix this problem before it drags the score down too much. Sure, I mean, the, you know, getting an insight, an insight normally is going to involve some combination of words uh, can automatically generate it. One needs to have some sort of noun, possibly a verb, adjectives, adverbs, so that you get an insight, so you, you get some understanding of what's going on. But insight is a pretty powerful word. It means that you're getting new, profound knowledge about what's going on. Actionable insights often include the, the phrase, so therefore, meaning we've got the customer feedback, we compared it to what we learned about the competitors, we've weaknesses in this area, and customers suggest an improvement, a particular thing. So therefore, here's a new project we should start today. Let's just have a look at the collectively, the audience too, about uh, these six uh, points on this slide and pick out, uh, I'll give you a clue, there's half of them are examples of actionable insights and the other half aren't. Have a look at that for five seconds. Okay, let's take the first one. The first one says the, you know, the NPS score this month dropped by 15 points. Is that an actionable insight? No, it's not because it isn't telling you uh, exactly what you should be doing. Um, Similarly, passengers complaining about the missed flight connections doesn't tell you directly what it is you should be doing about it. 20% you know, of the customers talking about price, well, just the simple fact that they talk about it, but it's you don't know whether they're saying the price is fantastic, that the price needs to be reduced or whatever. You don't have an actionable insight. and. Um, Whereas for the other three, let's see, Aljona, I think you need to go a slide on. Not certain. Yep. So the first three are not insightful or actionable. The other three are. So getting insights that a competitor has better quality of clothing. So this gives you something that you can dig into more detail on, look in detail at the customer's comments and work out precisely what you what it is that they see it's better. Is it something to do you know, with the buttons, the way the pockets are sewn on, um, the way that if it's jeans, the way that they're stonewashed. You, you'll get all of that from the, the analysis of the comments. Um, Quite low recently here, this is, uh, turns out to be a real example uh, here in Switzerland, though people, though well, Jona wrote it up. Um, one of the big, two big supermarket chains put a, a ban on plastic bags, doesn't have them anymore. You can't even pay for them. And yes, they're getting more positive feedback in social media about it. Of course, this can be interesting if you understand that about a competitor and you can uh, pick uh, and you might choose to copy them. It's also if you're using a net promoter system and you find that twice as many people who are detractors as the others uh, talk about uh, products ease of use, that's never going to be a good story and you are going to say, oh, so therefore we need to dig into this, the, the comment detail, understand what they really don't like and and improve that. So that Aliona mentioned the example earlier on of people, Air New Zealand customers having difficulty finding the booking code. 
and you know that would be a, a decent example of somebody's having an ease of use problem that they were able to to fix so let's turn to nick at manpower group to learn about the actionable insights that they picked up and that they used nick yeah thank you maurice so you know we've been working with uh with thematic for about a year and a half now and during that time have have found a lot of value uh really in in just making us you know allowing us to make a lot of better decisions um uh so our business as i as i think i mentioned a little bit earlier is is really around this um intersection between helping individuals find work and then helping clients find people who who are looking for work and so we survey those are really our two different customer segments and we survey both of those groups across three different brands um, and the responses vary from uh, in some cases as few as 500 a month all the way to uh, five five or, or more thousand a month depending on the depending on the brand and so just to get a sense of how it works for us we collect feedback through medallia which um, is a is a enterprise feedback management platform, uh, and for us, it's really there's two pieces. We we definitely look at the measurement side of it, but we're also pushing that feedback to our front line. You know, as Maurice has has talked about and and written a lot about in in that promoter system books. Um, you know, we're certainly driving a lot of front line action with that. But prior to thematic, the the thing we really struggled with was understanding. Um, what the what the feedback was telling us we needed to do um and we 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 found ourselves struggling with making decisions based a lot on anecdote or traditional thought and so now what we're doing is simultaneously to pushing feedback to the front line on an individual basis to action we're running all of it through thematic and getting a series of insights that we can quickly run into experiments or tests and put those into action at the same time uh, within the field within our frontline organization and as we as we implement those tests and refine them we're seeing a lot of success uh, in improving nps scores and improving um, our, our customer satisfaction and loyalty metrics in a variety of different areas cool Aliona, do you want to go to the next one? So just a couple a couple things we're seeing, which I think is is hopefully getting to what you're talking about, Maurice, with actionable insights. And the and the first ones really relate to our business specifically, um, but I think it 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 may have certainly some parallels. And that was um, you know, anecdotally we we really felt a lot like communication was a positive. Right. So when we were historically reading surveys and, you know, you talk about word clouds, Maurice, and this single concept of communication, when that came up, we tended to feel good about it. And what we uncovered when we started putting comments through thematic and putting and getting into sentiment was that it was almost uniformly negative um, and very impactful. So what was happening is when people mentioned communication and they mentioned things like, um uh not very helpful or not responsive it was driving pretty significant decreases in nps and, and for us and so it gave us very directive um you know prescriptive things we sh we needed to do to drive our nps up and furthermore by we could get an understanding of the type of impact we should expect to see another example um, that we saw was um, expectations tended to, to vary pretty much uh, significantly by brand, but there was a, a, a very big commonality around the human element um, of the experience. But what was interesting is that people talked about it differently. So the, you, the, the, the words and themes that our customers used to get into people or the person I worked with or individual names tended to vary by segment or by whether it was our clients or our job seekers, but it all touched on a common theme that we could um, stitch back to each other. So really, again, for us, we, it was very directed to us that we need to go and um, leverage that in our business and to, to reinforce that piece of the experience. So the other side of it, I think, which was really important for us to learn about how to leverage AI to make positive um, change and drive 
you know, uh, improvement efforts within the organization. And the first one was that as, an, as a net promoter system, you know, company, we often talk about the, the primary reason for recommendation, recommend, recommending. But what we also do, and Maurice, I think you've, you've driving this a lot, is this concept of improvement area themes. So what else can we do to improve your experience? And what we're doing is we're also running those comments through thematic and running that through that AI engine. And we're seeing that that's really as valuable as the NPS drivers themselves because it gives us a whole nother um, perspective on the types of themes associated with improvement areas by NPS segment or other customer segment. And then the second thing we're finding is that the, the ability to actually quantify the impact of certain themes on NPS. So as an example, if I improve communication within this customer segment, I should expect an NPS lift of four points. That is really invaluable to basically align senior leaders in an organization on the decisions that matter to our customers and that are going to deliver the, the biggest lift. Um, and matched up with uh, financial you know, elements and financial predictability um, has just you know, changed the game for us in terms of how we can move move projects and experiments faster um, in the organization. Cool. Th thanks, Nick. Well, that's the content part of our webinar complete. Now it's uh, time for some questions. You can ask questions in the panel that's uh, probably on the right, the question panel. Um, there's a question from someone here in the room with me, and it's about continuous analysis. It, looking at the, the Chinese Uber case, is it really necessary to do the analysis continuously? You know, why do they need to do it? Could they just stop at any point? Have they just learned everything there is? Mm, I, I can take this one. Um, it's, um, we often get asked this question and it's it really um, about the customer expectations, um, what we found is that they are continuously evolving and increasing. And um, something that customers found delightful um, back 10 years ago now is an expected um, feature of, of the service. And for example, ease of use for any software is expected, whereas in the past, um, people were more more acceptable, especially in the enterprise um, in enterprise software, to just kind of work around and do a lot of training. Um, and it's like with driving in a car, you're not just measuring this car speed once, right? You need to continuously monitor things and continuously making sure that you're on track. Um, Marisa, I can see there's a question here um, that I think you would be best to answer about um, collecting customer feedback and the survey fatigue. Do you think we'll ever reach the point where we will never need to ask customers for feedback? Hmm. Well, thinking about it, I think the answer would be different for consumer businesses and, you know, and B2B, meaning if you're selling to companies rather than selling to individuals. Um, the, the state of people's use of social media means you may be able to, to learn everything that you need to know by scraping everything that's out there, what people are posting in Facebook, Twitter, um, you know, magazine reviews, people, what people with YouTube channels are saying about your, your products and so on, the, the influencers. I could see that, I could see AI being more valuable than small sample size um, consumer surveys, at least more valuable to the consumers. You know, custo companies often do surveys because they want to measure their own people rather than that they want to do things for the for the actual end customer. For business to business, that's much harder. I, I doubt that you could replace getting the the customers direct feedback in a business to business situation because you got to know whether the person you're talking to is the decision maker an influencer an end user of whatever your product or service is 
um, and people change jobs all the time. Uh, I, I I really doubt you'd ever have the you'd have access to the intelligence about everybody's job position that would let you scrape things. And companies' internal discussions are all, you know, hopefully encrypted and not accessible to you behind their behind their firewall. So yeah, in short, I think AI could do most of the work in consumer businesses, but not in not in B2B. Yeah, that's a so so Aliona, one question that uh that I get certainly when I talk to peer groups um or even when I'm talking to customers and the conversation comes up is how can companies get started? You know, AI seems uh even though the terminology is becoming more commonplace, I think it still feels like there's a significant wall for companies to overcome in order to just get started. So what would be um, your recommendations as an as a expert in this space to do that? Yeah, I get asked this question as well. Um, and um, the number one thing is to make sure that you collect data that's core to your business. So for example, um, recently I got asked exactly this question by um, a friend of mine who runs a recruitment agency and she said we want to use AI to help companies hire better candidates and understanding who are the who are the ideal candidates based on what's happened in the past so I immediately asked her well um, you must have a lot of information about candidates and about their qualities but do you know do you have any data about what actually happened with them after you've placed them? How long have they stayed with the company? Um, was it a successful hire? And she said, well, actually, no, but we should be able to get this data. And this is the data that basically measures the outcome of what you're trying to improve. And without this data, you won't be able to build an, a solution to, to, that would show you how to, how to improve. And um, the other point is making sure that people that you're hiring understand what you're trying to achieve in, in the real world and are not all about running experiments, trying out the latest algorithms, but really about practical outcomes for the business. That's great. Um, Nick, I have a question for you. Um, somebody asked here in the audience, um, how do you decide when to buy a solution from a third party vendor versus build some something in house? Mm, that's a really good one. Um, you know, I think it, it depends a little bit on the, you know, technical aptitude or ability of a company. My personal perspective on this is um, particularly now with the rate of change in technology, uh, particularly in our, in just speaking from somebody who works in the, um, in the talent side of the business, right, in the, the, the rate of change in talent having to actually continuously build technology and, and the, um, the challenges of doing that, it's in most cases better to buy um, just because you're not stuck with an asset that you need to continually be responsible for improving, uh, particularly if that's not your core domain expertise. Um, I think if it's something that combines both technology building and um, uh, you know, expertise around AI um, or data science and some of those other applications that, you know, software applications that merge both, it's probably even more important just because it's going to be really expensive and costly to try and build your way into that. Uh, I think if it's, if it's more of a, if it's less of a software solution and it's more people-based, there's probably a lot of uh, benefits to building out teams internally of, you know, data scientists, that can partner with some of the technologies that you buy to really give it, um, to fully leverage them. But I don't think it's a situation, at least in my experience, where building software internally is going to be, is going to be the best use of resource. 
Okay, I think we probably have time for one more question. Do either of you see one there? You know, Maurice, I don't, I don't know if I'll if there is a question, but I have one that um, I think would be good for the audience, which is, um, you know, from your experience working with HP and a lot of different companies in your consulting background, you know, what are some common mistakes that you see companies making or, um, you know, uh, trying to overcome when they start pursuing AI solutions specifically within customer experience? Hmm. I, I'm going to, I, I think I've got a real brief answer for this. I think companies have a natural tendency to not want to add new vendors onto their list. And they're hoping that their CRM system that they're using uh, provides all of the AI and analytics that they need. And well, the, the, I'm going to make a dangerous statement because it, all of the companies are working on this and they're working hard and it's so it, it's evolving very quickly. The last time I went through the majority of what the CRM people are doing and what survey companies are providing, nine out of 10 of them were really bad. And by that, I mean that what they were proudly calling the output was mainly single words or you know, word clouds with one or two words, creating the great danger that internally that somebody at your company, let's suppose you're selling some sort of product and the word that comes up is support. And then you're in there with the leadership team and the people in the leadership say, team saying, yeah, I knew support was terrible, but you know, support, you can't tell anything from that word. It's, it, it's, you've got to have something that is going to be, hmm, the, that's going to be differentiating that the support on Saturday nights perhaps is defective or perhaps it's one, it's absolutely spectacularly brilliant that you need full sentences. So I think the main thing people should do who are going to look at, at, at different software solutions is to get a bunch of their customer data, make sure that it's anonymized, meaning that the customer names aren't in it, and ask the different vendors to do the analysis and find out whether you're getting prescriptive results, things where, that, where you can actually tell what to do. Um, you know, thematic will do a, a test analysis on your data for nothing. I'm sure there are other vendors that will do the same type of thing too. You know, find 10 vendors, compare them, but don't assume that because you're using whatever major software vendor that you're, uh, that you're using for your call center, don't assume that they know how to do this stuff. Most of them don't. Mm -hmm. So wrapping up, uh, what you should be picking up from here is that Artificial intelligence is developing, it's in motion. It's not just hype anymore. Um, in customer experience area, both the customers can benefit from having uh, the different types of analysis, especially the prescriptive analytics that tell the customers, that tell the companies what they can do to have the biggest positive impact on the customers. And, as in Nick's example at Manpower, it can also help you to identify the clear short list of priorities and to align your customer, your company about the few things that are most important to improve. So I'd like to thank you all for attending today. We really appreciate it. And we will send the slides and links to other material uh, to you, including a uh, recording of the webinar if the sound quality is good enough. So thank you all for attending today from around the world and goodbye. Thank you so much, Maurice.